Oh, that's me, isn't it? Yes, of course I, I recognise that name. I, I think so. I think so. Or should I have? I, I should have said Mr. Moo, right? Mr. Uh, Moo. Mr. Yes. Mr. Moo is in the house. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Moo is in the house. Hello, everybody. Right, All let's right. move that sharing over there. Mr. Moo's going to go away because I can't type. Well, he can. He's doing the typing, obviously. <laughs> rather, not not me at all. I'm just doing the speaking because he's a bit a bit shy. Uh, so, you see my slide? Yes. 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 Looks Great. Good. Okay. It won't be that well. The slides are really to remind me what to to demonstrate. So this is going to be basically a lot of demonstrations. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a recording. I'll I'll put that on my YouTube channel as well. So you saw a message in the chat. I have a YouTube channel that it's mentioned on the next slide. So let's go on to that. Um, so we have a bit of information about me. Uh, I'm not going to read it all because it's rather boring as I am. Um, but basically, I, I've been developing software across ooh, five decades. Wrote my first code in 1980 on a Commodore PET when some of you were probably not around. <laughs> so I've been developing on and off since then. Yeah, I did a degree in computer science. Then I moved into device driver development for Unix servers and C and C++. Got into end using computing in the Windows world in 1995 with a, a little company called Citrix. And I've been in that sort of sphere ever since, but sort of PowerShell is quite natural for me. So I, I'm, I'm one of those rare people, I think, that come at it from a, a, a fully developer background, which possibly gives me an edge or just makes me, me different. Um, but I think that's what helps me. But at least made a use of the, those five decades, hopefully. But these will be made available anyway afterwards. So enough about those. Oh, um, probably not so great unless you are in the UK. But that's for my first in person in person in person PowerShell workshop. I'm running on the 24th of March in a place called London. But I will be taking it around, certainly around Europe to other cities. It's uh, sort of 10 people maximum because it's very much a, an interactive session, not, you know, not training. Here is how you write a for loop. But, you know, people bring their problems and challenges and I help them with them because of my you know, practical experience in this world of uh, PowerShell. OK, so why use it for troubleshooting? Well, I've, I've never been a GUI person. Uh, why? Probably because, you know, when I started my coding uh, professional career in the late 80s, writing these Unix device drivers, I was using a green screen. And you know, my IDE was VI with all its arcane key sequences and regular expressions for searching. So I've always been a command line sort of person, not not really one of these what we call point or what I call point and click jockeys, but I think you can get much more done. And I think the world is coming back round to realise that now rather than finding a GUI and, and clicking around in stuff. So I just find it a lot quicker. So some of the reasons really are, I mean, it's certainly for consistency and particularly when you know how to troubleshoot a problem with a, you know, a few lines of PowerShell or a few scripts. Then you go, ah, it's that problem again. Right. I'm going to run those scripts, see if that's a problem. And then you might think, oh, actually, OK, I'm going to automate it a bit as well. Let, let's run that every hour and see what the problem is. Or let's run it through you know, a, a framework that can control it and allow remediation as well, like uh, like script runner. Uh, I, I need some money for that, obviously, later. But it gives you the same result each time. I find it's a lot quicker, but particularly when I show you things with like with event logs and, you know, because the answer, certainly if you've ever done any Microsoft exams, not that I've done any since my uh, MCSC and NT351 back in uh, back in the late 90s. I must get around to doing some sometime. But again, I think experience speaks louder. Uh, but with those, you know, the, the actual exam answer was always look at the event log. And in the old days, we had yeah, three or four event logs, application, system, security. And it's like, mm, there's not much there. How many do we have now? Hundreds. But I'll come back to that later. So you're trawling in inf yeah, interesting or useful stuff. Relevant stuff from that is a hell of a lot easier with PowerShell. And less boring. Again, depending on when you want to do it, much easier to automate via you know, scheduled tasks for, for your troubleshooting. Oh, is this has this problem occurred? Or, oh, this problem's occurred and I'm going to fix it. I always say with PowerShell stuff, I do things, you know, I write a script to do something because I'm too lazy to do it manually, which is a bit, as we say, tongue in cheek, as in 
not not really true, but kind of is in that I don't want to be doing the boring stuff. But do I spend four days writing something to save me four minutes? Mm, probably not. But if it's going to save you know lots of people four minutes, I'll put it on my GitHub. If it's going to save me four minutes every day, then yeah, I might automate it. But I don't again, believe in automating stuff for the sake of it. And again, there are some things I do so rarely in. Uh, troubleshooting uh, yeah I will go to a GUI for it or it's going to take me so long to figure out how to do it in PowerShell that you know the, the, the problem has you know, got worse or gone away by the time I figure out how to troubleshoot it in PowerShell so you've got to be what we say pragmatic of course improve your own skills it's all about you after all yeah we, we help our users don't we because we love our users but ultimately it's all about you isn't it so you know, help to build up your skills base by using this PowerShell stuff rather than you know going to an interview and someone says, can you use this GUI? Can you click on this? Can you do that? Yeah, but I'd much rather do it with a PowerShell script. Here's my GitHub repo. Go and have a look at some of that. Here's some of my tweets or blog posts. So again, it can help sell you to the sort of community that you'll probably invariably end up working in again, should you ever decide to leave where you're working at the moment. So of course, one thing is saying, oh, we found a problem. Another thing is be able to fix it. And I like to be able to do that as well. Find and fix all in one if possible. Not always possible, depending on what it is. Easy to share rather than tell someone, how do you troubleshoot that? Well, what I do is I get I arrange some stones in a line and I ask Mr. Moo what his thoughts are and I have a think. And it's, it's all a bit, it's a bit vague. You've got a script. You say, run the script with these parameters. I run it here and it does this and it tells you this. Yeah, it's kind of self-documenting and none of us like writing documents, do we? Oh, quick double click there. Sorry. We could do some log analysis with regular expressions. So please don't run away screaming just because I've mentioned the regular expression word. But <laughs> you know, it is very good for you know, analyzing log files. And depending on the log file, you know, a lot of them are following a similar pattern, you know, a, a date time, uh, a log level, and then some information. And it's very quick to get those into, into PowerShell. Again, you might think, well, I don't know regular expressions very well, but you think you're the first person stuck with regular expressions? Do you think you're the first person trying to parse that log file? Well, no, perhaps somebody's already written a script for it. <clears throat> and the, the lowest hanging fruit of all these in terms of log file analysis is IIS logs, which I think I've got in this deck. Whether I get through this whole deck with the demos by uh, an hour and what, an hour and a quarter, I don't know, but this, this uh, stuff will certainly be available because yeah, PowerShell is great for uh, trawling through you know, lots of IIS logs, particularly if you want to go across multiple days or you don't know what day you're looking for the problem. Fantastic for that sort of stuff without having to you go, well, I've got this great IIS tool for that. Yeah, but that's, again, a specific tool for a specific job. How many specific tools do you suddenly have in your kit bag? Lots, whereas a lot of the time you can just have one PowerShell. Let's come back. What do I mean by that? As in people go, well, you told me to do this. It didn't work. Well, here's a script. It works for me. Yeah. But of course, with that comes a challenge that you've got to make sure you test your script. You've got an idiot to proof it as much as possible, as in, oh, what if someone put this data into it? Or what if it found this? Oh, users aren't going to be users, which of course maybe your fellow admins or whatever else wouldn't be stupid enough to put that. Yeah, people always assume the worst. Whenever you're writing code, always think, how could this go wrong? Or what damage could this do if it was in the wrong hands or it was in the wrong place or doing the wrong thing? So you know, always code with caution. OK, so what sort of things are we talking about? Processes, yeah, as in applications, yeah, an application is a process or processes or threads. Yeah, we can get a lot of info about those, both what's happening now. So the sort of stuff we could do with Task Manager. You know, I'd much rather use you know get process something like that than I would use you know task manager. So let's go and start doing some demos. Hopefully a font size that you can all see well enough. I'm not quite maximise it. I've had to make my lovely 5K screen do 1920 by 1080. So it's right in the middle and it's kind of offset with the camera as well. So. Um, yeah, that's my excuse anyway. I'm sticking to it. So I mean, yeah, I can do a get process. What's that's going to tell me? Oh, lots of stuff, but you know, the, the way we can do stuff, 
we'll do to get interesting things out. We could scroll up. Obviously, this has sorted it alphabetically. But one of the first things I'd probably want to do is just look at you know, the CPU. So I get in fact, let's, let's clear that. So if I do a get dash process and sort CPU descending, no, it's all the tab completions, but you know, it's very easy. And by anyone that select the first, you have know, the top 10. Oops. Yeah. And that is the CPU. So I'm just going to find task manager. And that's no, that's not task manager. Uh, close. Not good with the icons because I use MSRDC, but more about that later. Where's task manager gone? I can't find task manager. OK, I'll tell you what I'll do then. I'll start it. Oh, I am an admin here anyway, so I can just start it from here, couldn't I? Right, so that, that is actually sorting on that column. So this is typically how I will have my task manager set if I do use it, because I do use GUI tools as well. I'm not just a slave to PowerShell. Use the best tool, quickest tool for the job at the time for a quick look at stuff. Task manager is OK, although notice I have mine, which is something I found difficult in Windows 11 to find. I, I have mine paused, which I do in all the other OSs I use as well, where it's normally set to normal. Why? So it's easy to see things puts less load on the system. So if you've got something here, you go, that's weird. And then it disappears. You haven't lost it. Yeah, you've still got it. You've still got it here. And then you can just do an F5 to manually update it. So somebody you know, says to me, because again, part of my background is, has been troubleshooting prob troublesome systems for you know, many years. Even before I got into Windows, I was doing performance monitoring on Unix. Uh, so it's kind of, someone says, oh, this machine's running really slow. Let's jump on and you look at it and if you look sort on the CPU, it's like, well, there's not really very much going on, is there? System idle process 94%. That's pretty good. Teams, yeah, well, I'm presenting through it, so it probably would use a little bit of CPU. But what if you've just missed the problem? Yeah, because that's what we call SOD's law. Yeah. There's been a problem. As soon as you jump on, your very presence there means yes, I can the problem has gone away. How many times has that happened to us? Which is great. But then it's also frustrating. I don't like problems going away because they will come back. They always do. So if we sort that on C, so if I log onto a machine and try and figure out what was taking the CPU, the first thing I would do is sort on CPU. So this is the amount of CPU it's used in the life of the process. So for instance, if we look at OneDrive there, at the moment it's not using any CPU, but it's used 20 minutes. Up here we see this is in seconds, so 20 times 60 is you know, 1200. And obviously, I did this a little while ago. So we can say, yeah, that has used uh, a decent uh, CPU. But how long has that been running for? I actually had to reboot last night because I got some Windows updates, but I tend to only reboot every every couple of weeks, and unless I get a blue screen, which I had for the first time on Windows 11 last week, I think it was. So normally these would be much higher. But yeah, when when did I boot? OK, well, we're going to drop into the um, WMI side of things now. Well, that's a slide coming up in a bit, but I'll, let's just find out anyway. Uh, oh, I haven't got it there. OK, so I was trying to use Control R to search, but we'll come back to that later. So what I'm going to do is get in instance Win32 and spot operating system. Tab complete, which takes a little while the first time you use it because it needs to go and basically go and get all the WMI classes, of which we'll see later. There are hundreds, if not thousands. Uh, OK, but where's the last boot time? Well, again, if you're familiar with PowerShell, you'll know that a, a lot of these um, objects have the ability to just display what the person implementing has decided were the most interesting. We can pass it through format list star or select star to show everything. Where we see everything in here, we can see there is actually a last boot up time. So what typically what I would do is. Select last. I don't want to type it all. I could tab complete it, but because I'm, I've got that sad sense of humor, I go last boot. <coughs> which goes and gets it. So that booted at, um, oh, 
eight minutes past midnight this morning. I was working late on some power shell code with a customer, as you do, because it was interesting. Uh, but most of the stuff I do is, fortunately. So that's why I last booted. As you kind of, we'll come back to WMI and stuff. But how long has OneDrive been running? Well, what I can't see in Task Manager, even on the mighty Windows 11, is how long that has been running for. Various things in here. The properties is properties of the XE, not, you know, so what version am I running? Yeah, great. But when did it start? So again, I can find that very easily with PowerShell. And now I'm going to switch to using aliases. So if you know any sort of Linux, Unix world, we'll say where I, uh, where I came from, then to get processes in there, we have something called PS. Don't use these in scripts. Don't use aliases because somebody's seeing PS in a script. Yeah, what does PS do? Yeah. But when you're doing stuff on the command line, it just makes it quicker and easier. So I could say PS minus name one. And notice what I can do is tab complete the processes as well. Or are you familiar with control space? Control space is great. And every time I present, there's somebody who doesn't seem to know about this. And I, I guess it's just not widely publicized that for options, for all sorts of autocomplete things, you can have control space, which will show you all of the things matching what you've typed. And then also you can your cursor through them. If I wanted to look at other options, control space again. Yeah. Notice at the bottom left, it shows me even what type it is. So does it take a string or does it take a number or can it take multiple strings, you know, like an array? Yeah, we see the type. Which is rather useful. And um, so we'll do it OneDrive. Yeah, again, shows me, oh, look, I've got two OneDrive processes. Uh, but how many how many Teams processes do we think I've got? Um, Ten. <laughs> yeah, place your bets, please. Yeah. I don't know where that's, where's that come from? Oops. I'm not going to bother counting him again. I'm lazy. Yeah. Pipe through measure object. Ten. Whoa, you predicted or you've hacked me. <clears throat> <laughs> um, sorry, yeah, that's that's uh, ten decimal. Yeah, not not uh, too binary, of course. Um, yeah, and probably quite a few edges as well. But again, we can start to see how I'm, I'm starting to troubleshoot. You know, do I have a lot of Teams processes? Well, yeah, I could look in Task Manager and start going. Where are they? Let's sort on. Uh, one, two, three, four. No, no, counting. No, I'm, I can't, I'm too old to be counting. I can't, you know, if I had that many birthday candles on my cake, the house would burn down. Just pipe it through, measure. Yeah. How many edge tabs have I got? Well, edge processes. That is probably 50 plus, 75. Yeah. But how much memory are they taking in total? Uh, if, if we look, select the first 10. WS is the working set. That's what we see in Task Manager in the working set column. I think by default, Task Manager puts up uh, private memory, but I don't like that as a, as a figure. So we can see the edge processes all taking up a certain amount of working set. But how much? Well, let's add it all up because I'm not adding it up in Task Manager. Measure minus property working set. Uh, yeah, so that's how many properties there are. And if I actually bother adding them up by using the minus sum, don't you love live demos? You see, we all make mistakes, particularly me, but you know, I admit them and move on. So if you see lots of red on your screen after you've executed your fantasticist, that's not a word, by the way, your best ever script, don't be demoralized. Yeah have some good error handling in there but that's a different presentation so that's how much it is uh, how many is that uh, is that divide that by a million yeah, again i'm too lazy to do that okay so what i'm going to do is bracket it and let's see how much it's taking up in gigabytes again can i be bothered to type and work out how many zeros and of course i don't i'm one of those people that believes that you know a kilobyte is 1024 bytes and people go well that's a thousand and that's back to where pre-start conversation about metric because somebody told me well 1024 isn't very sort of metric it's not very logical it's like your illogical british imperial units where we have, we have 14 ounces 16 ounces you see i didn't i don't know them 16 ounces to a pound 
where a gig you know, should be a thousand megabytes, which should be a thousand k. Yeah. Anyway, I, I waffle slightly just for a change. Word waffle meaning yeah, talk and talk and talk without really saying anything, which I'm very, very good at. So we can see my working sets for all my edge processes there are taking up 4.8 gig. Is that a lot? I don't know. Have a, I'm not, but I'm not troubleshooting a problem at the moment. Again, what I would say with a lot of troubleshooting is if you've got a system or a user or something where there isn't the problem, you know, run the, the troubleshooting in parallel, run the same commands on the two different machines and see where the answers vary massively. You know, if you've got a slow machine where edge sum of working sets was 200 gig, then it makes your four look a bit weak. And if you haven't got you know, a lot that much gig memory in a machine and it's like mm, yeah perhaps we've got problems perhaps we are doing a lot of uh, hard page faults so we can do a lot here just with the various properties because remember there are a lot of properties now if i do if i look at so i was going to look at one drive wasn't i so ps minus name one drive and again this is the command line completion in powershell 7 it's, it's telling me I've, I've entered that command before so if i just hit the right uh, arrow yeah, it puts it in there ready for me so I could change it or just go. But that still doesn't tell us the start time. So what I could do is I could say select start time if I could type it or I can again tab complete it because I'm lazy. So I can see those processes both started at that time, which is which. Well, let's say an ID yeah, and so on. But what what other properties are there? Well, there are various ways you can look because this is what how I do a lot of stuff is by you know, uh, and with new um, PowerShell commandlets. I've just started doing some stuff with OneDrive now because I want to be able to figure out and get a whole OneDrive history for a file. I know you can do it in Explorer, but that doesn't give you any granularity. It's it gives you granularity of an hour, whereas I want to know down to the minute. So I've started looking at those. So I just yeah, get the module, explore what commands are in the module, then explore what uh, those command let's do and then explore their results so one of the things you can do is select star so select everything so obviously if we did that we would have so if we did that for a lot of processes here even here we've got a couple of screens of information so if you're not using it already let's um get used to using outgrid view or ogv as it's called which is Brilliant. It's sort of almost like a built in GUI in PowerShell, GUI graphical user interface. So, this allows us to do all manner of stuff in here. We can sort and filter, or we can filter on various things. So, if, in fact, I could turn this almost into a mini static task manager. So, if I actually do that and then control backspace, back, backspace, no, control backspace even. Deletes a word at a time, yeah, so I don't have to do lots and lots of repetitive backspacing. So this is now all of my processes and all of their properties. So as we can see, if I scroll across on this measly 1920 display, uh, you'll see there's a lot of columns. We do get command line, which can be very, very useful. Something again, we don't see. Oh, no, we do see in Task Manager, actually, don't we? Don't think, see things like start time. So these can be very useful. Parent process, and we get information about where the process is, you know, where the binary is from and its version. So there's a lot of interesting information out there. I use the word interesting loosely, probably wouldn't get you very far at a, at a party, but it depends what sort of parties you go to. I don't get invited to those anymore. Um, so a lot of information there, so we can see. So you know, if, with my OneDrive stuff I'm doing at the moment, I'll just do, um, Get a command look and just pipe it, select star through outgrid view just to see what sort of information there is there. And because, of course, then you can filter on that sort of stuff. Always filter left. So, what you wouldn't do is do something like where name equals OneDrive. Why not? Because PS there is getting all however many processes there are, which there are probably quite a few. If I could type measure, it would help. Yeah, so I've got 402. So it's fetched all 402 processes back and then filtered them. Whereas where I do a PS name OneDrive, 
that says to the commander, only get me processes with the name OneDrive, or you can use patterns in there as well. So you could say one star. Yeah, or if you're interested to see what, what Citrix processes I've got, what I'll do is I'll do a PS. Now I can't, uh, I don't think I can do, a, I know you can't filter on path, so you'd have to get them all and do a where, or because I'm in an immediate uh, PowerShell console, then I'm going to do a question mark, which is an alias for where object. But again, don't use that in your scripts. And so I'm going to say where path minus match or oh, regular expression coming scary citrix why have i put two backslashes because backslash is a special character in regex so there we go that's every citrix process where we've got citrix in the path because you probably know by working with you know agent software that there's usually quite a lot of x's working out of a one or more dll uh, directories so we could then select ID, comma, name, comma, start time, comma, math. Yeah, so we can say actually they're all running out of the, the same folder. This is the uh, still 32 bit, um, well, what you used to call, it used to be called a receiver, now called the workspace app, but underneath it's all still, well, <laughs> all still the IC, ICA client as it was back in. Uh, 1995 when I started with the Citrix stuff, albeit I was using on Unix clients, not uh, not Windows clients. So you can see we get a wealth of information and we can filter. Filter left where possible. What can I filter on? Well, again, control space. Those those are the things that I can I can filter on. But I can also get information on a running service. So what version of OneDrive am I running without going to Task Manager? What I'll do then again is minus name one go away drive. Pipe it through, uh, get item property or GP for short, if I was uh, doing this interactively, which I am. We'll see. And what does that do? Well, that now tells us about the XE. So notice that's now the XE, not the actual process itself. So that's vaguely useful. I can say, well, that's that's dated March. That's pretty fairly recent. But again, don't trust timestamps. I could, if I had right access to this as an admin, and I am actually running this as an admin, although everything I've shown you so far, I don't actually need to run as an admin. I don't log on to my desktop as an admin. That would be madness. Um, so, yeah, timestamps cannot be trusted. What I'll do then instead is, and why are the two? Are the two OneDrives in there? No, because there are two OneDrive processes, if you remember. So for each one, it's gone and got, oh, look, they're running the same executable. Yeah. But what if I want to know the version number? Get item property. Again, if we do a select star minus first type even, you'll see this version info in there. It's telling me what version it is. It tells me the vendor. So what I tend to do is do this GP select. Ooh, I can't type. Select expand version info select star. But again, that's done two lots uh, because there are two processes. You know, if I just pick one process, don't just pick. So this is the block for one process so I can see various things about it. So if I'm looking at a process, I don't really understand what it is, but it's using a large amount of memory. You know, again, because I can sort by memory. Uh, PS sort working set. You know, if I sort it on CPU, descending select minus first 10 see if there's anything i don't recognize in there that, uh, again, probably everything you recognize in there as well but you know, if there's a process i didn't recognize and i could just pipe it through and, and get the, the um, version info i could even do it in, in one command here to get version info so I, you know, i'll do a lot more process stuff just with the, the command line as opposed to to task manager See how one one bullet point leads to quite a lot of demonstrations. <laughs> Services again, you know, start, stop, interrogate, and this is worth talking about. And uh, sorry, let me just have a sip of this vodka. Uh, sorry, water, because there is built-in get service um, within PowerShell. Uh, 
we can see there. Again, there is a lot more information available, but there's not as much information as you would possibly like, which is why we have to switch to WMI, which I'll come back to when I get to the WMI slide. So if we pipe that through outgrid view again, we can see you know, the, the descriptions. We can see the, the full path to the binary, which can be quite useful. Notice that it's always including the, any command line option, so it can be a bit of a pain too. If you want to get just the executable, um, then you have to do a bit of regex parsing. Say, oh, split on space, but what if there's space in the string because it's got quotes and it's like, yeah. Think, well, really complex regex? No, I just use two regexes. One where it starts with a quote. So I'd, I'd break it on a corresponding closing quote. And if it didn't match that, I'd match it breaking on a space. Yeah, rather than trying to come up with one fancy regular expression which matched both instances. Yeah, keep your regular expressions simple. The KISS approach, as we call it. So various bits of information in there, but there isn't some information like the current process ID, which can be useful rather than to try and tie it back to you know get dash process and look for the exact same command line. And what if I've got two command lines? Because you think, well, hold on, how does um, task manager do it? If I can find the services, is that services? Yeah, so services. It knows. So how do I get this? So again, we, we can do that through WMI or him, as we should call it now, because WMI you can't use in. Why didn't I hit tab instead of? Yeah, so we're in PowerShell 7 here. So if I do a get WMI object, which some of you may have seen before. Uh, that should not work. What? Hit command. Hmm, strange, that shouldn't work. Don't use WMI because a lot of PowerShell 7 I've seen, it's not there. I don't know where it's come from, but your PowerShell is probably better than me and you know, and you're laughing at me. But that's the advantage of these virtual things. Even um, Mr. Moo's laughing at me. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, OK. Yes, yeah, schoolboy error. But we'll come back to that uh, for services. Um, but again, there's not just the services get service. Remember, with PowerShell, we have uh, a you know, the um, approved verbs get and set, so they're usually in opposites, uh, new and remove, stop and start. So what service commandlets are there? There's obviously get service. Well, I can do a get dash command, which I just showed you as GCM and start service. Now we can see there's quite a lot. But what we can do actually, because a lot of those are from, as we can see, from lots of different PowerShell modules. What I can do more sensibly here is if I do a minus noun service, that will just search for the commands where the noun is just service rather than Azure service. Yeah. So we've got verb, the doing word, and then the noun. So I can do a minus noun. Now I don't have to worry about all these other things which have just happened to have service in the name. So you can see we can do quite a lot with services. Uh, new in seven, if I get a six, six, PowerShell six, not that core, no. Let's get uh, PowerShell five, Windows PowerShell, I could type it. So that's PowerShell five, that little bit. And uh, if we do the same command, uh, GCM on a noun, service you'll see a slight difference uh, oh <laughs> yeah i can't move that out of the way can i notice there's no remove service in here yeah which there is in powershell 7. so if you had to do a powershell 5 windows powershell remove service you could call out to uh, sc.exe you know sc.exe the script uh, service controller executable but whatever you do don't just type SC. Um, because SC is the, I'm, sure I'm failing to show it here, don't you love dive demos? Definition SC. They not do that in PowerShell 7. That's interesting. Is that because too many people have typed SC and got? 
Really good at these demos, aren't I? Uh, GCM, right, get dash, just type SC guy. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Miller. <clears throat> Notice I've typed SC here in PowerShell 5, and it's calling set content. How many people have I seen trying to do you know, SC.XC uh, query or stop or remove, and it gives an error because SC is actually set content? Yeah, if you type SC.XE, then it will fire up SC. Yeah. If you want to know what other commands there are, we can say GCM SC, set content. Whereas over here, GCM SC, they've removed that built in uh, alias. Yeah, that's, that's built into PowerShell. And you could un alias it in your profile if you wanted to. But what else is there with? Yeah, what other executables have I got with uh, which start with S? Yeah. Control space. Remember I mentioned that earlier? Oh, look. Screwdriver. Hey, wasn't expecting that to be there, but uh, Ooh. not that I've got a problem with it being there at all. But uh, yeah, again, control space gives me this. Yeah. Tab completed list. Obviously, if you've got a lot of stuff, it will say, Do you really want me to show you all X hundred entries? And a lot of the time you don't. But you, this is where it's nice that you can, you know, if I if I want to the one I always forget command is one with for disconnect for the uh, MSTS remote sessions. And it's got this in it somewhere. But I'm not sure where. Yeah. So I can just pattern match on star this star. And find that it's TS Discon. Yeah. I always think it's Discon for some logical reason, but it's TS Discon. Yeah. So PowerShell can help us explore you know, executables as well as just PowerShell commandlets. Because you know, PowerShell is great with you know get command, get help, get module, find module. You know, it, it's meant to, to really help. So we do a certain amount with the various um, commandlets we saw there for services. But again, think about whether your code's going to run on PowerShell 5 or PowerShell 7. PowerShell 7 is great if you've got access to it. And if your customers allow you to use it, my customers don't because their customers, because I work mostly for software vendors, probably haven't got it installed across their estate because it's not standard part of you know, even Windows 11 yet. So we have to slum it on you know, PowerShell 5. And, and sometimes I even get shouted at for writing it on PowerShell 5. Um, so, well, yeah, but you need to support PowerShell 2. You know, PowerShell 2 that went out of um, support how long ago? And PowerShell 3 has been out for, what, 10 years? Uh, so I'm just finding the app to turn the light on above my desk because you know, I can't be, I'm too lazy to use those old fashioned switch things. And then I find I've gone to the wrong smart app. That's clever, isn't it? And then I go to the wrong app. I'm getting flustered because it's on Tapo, not on Smart Life. And eventually, because I know you all want to see my face, or one of them at least, all my light comes on. So yeah, think about whether you're targeting PowerShell 5 or PowerShell 7, because there are some subtle differences, like WMI, um, SC. I have to use five. Permissions, yeah? In the old days, we used iCackles, familiar with iCackles. You can do a lot of stuff, much better than cackles. And then there was xcackles, which is on the resource kit, and so we could do things. But we can actually do a, we can actually build in commands now, which can work on more than just files. So we've got, again, if we get command, minus noun, ACL, access control list. So you've got two, get ACL, set ACL. So if I can do a get ACL on it shows me that. And again, let's assign that to a meaningful variable name. I like ACL. And we can then to pipe it through get member GM. So we can see actually there's quite a lot of things. So there's properties. That we saw, but then there's also methods. You know, this is where we're getting into interesting PowerShell stuff because we can call methods. So, for instance, I could find out the owner. Tackle dot get yeah. um, again. Too lazy to type it all. Probably get it wrong anyway. So, tab complete. And I don't know. And what it's telling me here is I should have given it a target type. 
which is probably where I have to RTFM as what is a target type. So I'd have to actually go and look at the, the manual for that to figure out what a uh, target type is or go and search for my previous code. But what we can do here, it's very easy to, and again, I've got some samples, I think, on Pastebin, probably tweeted them a few times as well, where if you want to copy the permissions from one folder structure to another, you can literally do a, a get ACL of one and then pipe it through a set ACL on the destination. So we can just copy the permissions, but we can do a lot more with that. It doesn't just have to be, I can't remember if we can, can we do it anywhere now? Top of the head, whether we can do it on registry keys here. You know, registry keys are through the PS drive. What we had a guy leech key. No guy leech key, what's that all about? Yeah, see, so I can get permissions on registry keys. There is a limit to what it can get. I don't think it can do it on services yet, but most things which you've got a PowerShell drive. So you can see here you can do permissions on. So we can see here's our registry, PowerShell providers where I can do permissions. Uh, I think like variables doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, but you can get it all your environment variables through an env drive, which is this one. Yeah, so I can see what we've, we've got there. Uh, the certificate drive, which again, I think probably mentioned in the slides, so I can see what certificates I've got. LS cert colon backslash we can see we've got uh, the local machine and current user as you'd expect if you were having the uh, mmc up so if we look at the local machine again we've got various stores uh, look at my see what i've got in there some certificates for techsmith snagit for some reason or i could look and see what i've got for my current user i have many certificates interesting then again, we can get more information. Yeah, when's my uh, IIS certificate going to expire? Well, that information is in there. So if we do a select start to show all properties and then minus first one, we, also, we can see there's a not after, yeah, which is actually is a date time. So I could say machine where not after is less than get current date you are add days 30 so do any expire in the next 30 days no because it's yeah, 2027 so that's what um let's give it three let's give it 30,000 days yeah so see so it's picked up a few which expire within 30,000 days but i probably don't have to quite panic yet but when do they expire well let's select subject and uh, not before and not after yeah these look like they all went on when windows 11 was installed on this repaired laptop because the hard drive had died after five months but uh, i'm not on this call to knock huawei so i won't and you can see we've got 2032 in some of those as well so they're, they're not in danger of running out but again you can now start to say ah troubleshoot right so i could write a script that would go and query my is box or boxes yeah to then go and get certificates see if any then send me an email or maybe i'm using um, something else with certificates and i could actually get it to request the certificates rather than just email me saying hey certificate on this machine runs out in on this date you've got this many days so you can start to see the automation potential so that you can do that probably somebody's probably already done it once i mean i've, I've got a script on my github repo which would link in the slides because i've got 130 140 scripts on there off all, all around sort of troubleshooting there's definitely one on there for finding iis certificates which are going to expire within x number of days by pulling out the iis servers from active directory and going querying all of them so you, you don't have to think oh, okay which my iis servers is that one and that one and then you forget one which is the main one which is you know your chief something officer uses and then put the uh, certificate expires and you're in trouble it's always network isn't it? it's always dns so what can we do well yeah we can do ping equivalents um one of my favorites is test network connection um which isn't there in powershell 2 i forget when it came in but again 
crawl space to see the, the arguments. We can either just do it, to, do it to simple ping. So GRL, my jump box, just does a, a simple ping to it and the results come back. But again, that is an object. Uh, ping equals that comes back, dollar ping, select star. So you can see we've got a number of things in there. So rather than, I don't know if any of you have ever tried parting the output from you know, ping.exe, which we you know had to do in the old days. You know, I've been scripting since the 90s in these sorts of environments. So you end up you know, trying to do text parsing in batch files of um, ping results or IP config, and it gets pain. This is where PowerShell, because it's based on objects, is much easier to uh, work with the results. So I can look at the results here and I can see you know, TCP test succeeded. So I could say, yeah, if dollar ping dot TCP test succeeded, and that should have output is okay. That's interesting, isn't it? Mr. Moo, help. Let's succeed. Ah, yeah, yeah, because TCP, yeah, guy, you're being stupid. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moo. I don't need the puppet, do I? I can just talk down to my desk. Here's the honest look. Yeah, and he's helped me there. Why? Because the TCP test succeeded is false because I didn't do a TCP test. I did a ping test. When you write scripts, when you do things, when you demonstrate to prestigious user groups, make sure you know what you're doing. No, Tiger, next time, get some big monitor. Yeah. <laughs> but if I do want to do a TCP test, this is where it really does come into its own, I think, in terms of not having to get uh, third party tools, I can tell it a port. So without a port, it does a ping. I can say, OK, is port 443 alive? And let's give it a, a more meaningful name. Or call it port 443 is quite catchy. Dollar port 443. Notice the time TCP test succeeded is true. Yeah. And this time, uh, if we again, we look at all its members. You can see we've got other things in here. You can see which interface it went through. It's gone through the USB C hub. I've got hiding behind my, uh, my monitor. Network context the route, all sorts of things in here that we can get. So I can test, is that particular machine alive and listening on that port? Because if it's not listening on a port, we might have a problem. Let's pick a random port. And that is taking a little bit of time. We can tell, is it going to work or not? Mm, probably not. No, my luck, I would have picked a port that's got something listening on it. So yes, I have got port scanners in PowerShell, very easy to do. Yeah, if I want to do a port scan of all of the first 30 ports, how do I do that? This is that's for each object. Yeah. But of course, I can type percent a bit quicker than I can even tab complete that. I'm going to output the number and then I'm going to Uh, port dollar underscore. And there we have a port scan. I'm not going to wait till that to finish. Uh, I'll come back to the slides and then we can come back to see if any of what the other ports were were open. I just sat a machine on my internal network, so if there are a few ports open, I'm not overly bothered about it. Um, there is a problem with testnet connection, which you're actually seeing here, is it is quite slow. But there are other ways around it. Again, something I tweeted a while ago. And I've got in some scripts is where you get at the underlying uh, C sockets API and you can do effectively the same thing, try and make a connection, but you set the timeout yourself. So you can set a two second timeout because it's something like 20 or 30 seconds here, which you can't change. Which is a bit of a pain. Anyway, back to this sort of stuff. So all sorts of network uh, issues. We can do DNS queries. So if DNS is working. And we can actually check the network interfaces themselves. What speeds are they running at? What profiles am I running with? There's a whole wealth of information we can get there. 
bring a lot of that information together and we can analyze slow logons looking for, for things. The ultimate in that is a, a script from a company I do work for called ControlUp. If you go to their website, controlup.com, there's a in the resources section, there's a, a section called scripts. And that has a script that allows you to analyze the duration of a logon, which I will come to. Let's go back here a moment. Not that I'm advertising at all. Because uh, these scripts you don't need to use uh, troll up for at all. You can literally just go and grab the script from here. You don't have to sign in here at all. Copy the script, paste it into something, and you'll see it's quite a, a lot of blocks and whatever. It's it's over five thousand lines now. I've been working on it for four years, but it existed even before I worked on it. But you can run this. And the only actual mandatory parameter it needs is is a uh, domain name slash backslash username. And once you've done that, it will give you all sorts of information, pulling stuff from event logs, pulling stuff from process auditing, uh, WMI queries. You know, if, if you want to sort of see how a, a, you know, a beast of a troubleshooting script fits together, then analyzed logon durations in its wealth is um, quite involved because there's a lot of uh, platform invoking, as in calling of Windows APIs in there. Uh, let's get rid of those because you're not really going to help. No, I'm trying to do a demo. Do you mind? Thank you. So, so yeah, five thousands of five thousand plus lines uh, of, of of exciting stuff in there. If I troubleshoot slow logons, and um, I do a couple of things, and again, I've got a couple of simpler scripts which are available on my GitHub repo, as it might be caused by a a process which is causing problems. So we already said, well, we've got processes. So how do we know what processes? We go, you run PropMon, process monitor from Sys Internals. Great tool, yes. Ah, but my logon was two hours ago. My The calls only just come through to the help desk. Ah, OK, I get my time machine out and I will go back in time and I will set, pro no, I think about a time machine, I do something more useful with it. And um, I'll tell you more about that last week. So what we'll do then instead is use process auditing. What do I mean by process auditing? Have I got a, an event viewer here? No, because I don't use it very much. Like I say, now we can see I'm going to, I'm going to, in fact, I'll leave that running now in that window, uh, Windows terminal here. And what I will do is, let's run up good old event viewer. Don't use it very much. Why? Because they use PowerShell because it's much easier, particularly with command line history. Once you've done a, you know, a, a search in PowerShell once, you've got it in your command line history. As long as you've got a persistent PowerShell profile file, as long as you've got a persistent Windows profile, so a local profile generally on a machine, then you know all those commands that you used in the past are going to be there. So if I see what else have I done in here with get win event, and I do control, so control R to search, and I can control R to search again. You can see there's one I put out. It was quite a popular tweet the other week. Um, you know, what, uh, what has Windows installer done recently? So I know the provider name is, how do I know the provider name's that? Well, again, get dash win event minus provider name. In fact, I don't know, is it going to be install? It might be install, it might be MSI. Ah, stupid boy. List provider, not get event. See, wildcards are their own worst enemy, or was it? would it be Windows, and, or would it be just be installer? We don't know, but this, again, this is how you can explore what logs and um, providers there are, because there are logs and the providers. So you can go and interrogate all of those quite easily. And look what's interesting. But then you think, oh, hold on. Yeah, Windows logs. The, this is the old days for event logs with you know, lots of event sources in there. And yes, you could um, filter. Oh, I've got rid of my left, right hand side. Sorry. So we could filter the log and do the equivalent by going event sources to M. Of course, it highlights it, which is pain. MSI. There. Where is it there? Bang. OK. So yeah, I could use event viewer to do the same thing. But again, I have to look at one event at a time. Whereas if I'm doing it in here, yeah, I can get them all in one go or I can get them all in uh, a grid view. 
Yeah. Oh, something I didn't tell you about a grid view, which is exciting. Um, well, actually, yeah, it's not exciting, I would say, but it's useful. And again, this is only providing the, the basic columns. We could do a select star. We get a whole lot more information. And we can we can move the columns around. It's like, uh, no, actually, what I want is the time created. So I'm going to move that. Oops, almost got it. Resize. I can, you can move the columns around if you want. Um, you can move them around this way, remove columns if you don't want them with, with the grid view. But what I was actually going to show you was if you find something in here which is of interest, you go, oh, that's interesting, that particular one, which isn't. Um, I'm just acting now, as you can tell. I've highlighted it. I now I can't do anything with it, so I can't really right click anything. I can't write. Well, I am right clicking, but nothing's happening. But what I can do is I can hit Control C on the keyboard, and if I now fire up something called Notepad, you may have heard of. Oh, we'll forget what file it was looking at there. You see what it's done here. If we do a word wrap, you see it's taken that whole line. I think it's a big window. Yeah, from the grid view. Oh, this will be when I had it and on my 5K monitor. Did I mention I've got a 5K monitor? Uh, it cost me a lot of money. So that's put that line from there. Yeah. So it hasn't put the column headings in, which isn't very nice, but it has put that data in. So if you're now going to go and search for that on Google or Bing, if you're using Bing, I wouldn't waste your time to be honest. Although it's got AI now. <laughs> I've got to be very careful what I say about Bing, otherwise, when it takes over the world, it'll come back and get me. Um, so if there's things in here, so if you think, oh, I wonder if somebody else has had this detection of product thing. OK, well, now I can go and copy that, paste it into um, my favourite search engine, which is mine is DuckDuckGo, and go, and go and look for it there. Although, to be honest, if you've not used Microsoft Power Toys, Microsoft Power Toys is also very useful because that will do OCR on the screen. Um, again, I'm not going to show that, but uh, you know, shift win T and it will do uh, OCR, optical character recognition, so it will read stuff from an image. But a lot of dialog boxes that you get up on screen, not a lot of people know that you can actually hit Control C on them, and that'll put the text from the dialog into um, the Windows clipboard. You all know about Windows clipboard history, don't we? Which we should have enabled. Hopefully, I haven't got any meaningful passwords in here. Always enable Win. Uh, Clipboard history on your own machine. I'm not sure about users. Some people say oh, bad for security, but it's very useful, particularly if you want to do a tweet with several things you've got on the clipboard. So you don't have to go back and copy them again. You just scroll down your clipboard. I have to be careful how far I go because I might have some passwords in there because it does put the passwords in there as well. So what was I doing? Yeah, so event logs. But remember, with event logs, there are rather a lot. So what event log do I look in for this slow log on or for this particular user problem? Yeah, how many event logs have I got? And there's a slide later on, which I'm never, never going to get to, but I think last time I ran it, there were over a thousand event logs. So again, we can do a bit dash win event minus list. Guy, you're not fit to be in front of the keyboard. Get win event minus list. Log star measure how many? Oh, only four hundred. Only four hundred ninety-nine. Yeah, logs to look through. Yeah, not even five hundred. Yeah, how easy is that to just go through Event Viewer? Because not everything is in the application or system event log. How many providers? Some which haven't been set up properly by the look of it. One thousand two hundred fifty-five providers, where one provider will. Uh, feed its events into one or more event logs. So I haven't got 1255 of these to look through, but some might be relevant. Yeah. So to something. So if I'm looking for something to do with uh, RDP, yeah, I can see there are various terminal services and other things. Oh, and the WordPad provider. That's useful, isn't it? What we're getting around to here is that the, yeah, there are a lot of events. What I find is massively useful for troubleshooting in Windows environments, I recommend it to all my customers and my engagements, is to set up process auditing, which when you set it up, uh, ideally through group policy, 
you can do it through script various of my scripts will actually set it up for you as well or you can set it up through locally through security policy easiest way is down here you don't need failure you shouldn't get any process creation failures that's when it actually is going to start a, a legitimate executable because it will have errored before that and fails for some reason maybe you've run out of resources so success is all you really need couple that with command line auditing and then what you get in event viewer so if we look at 4688 which is a process has started we can see for well, this user as zaphod and we're even getting the whole command line which is a not defined in there it's another group policy setting or, or a registry setting again i've tweeted about that many times mainly because i tweet things so that i can go back and search and find them later because my memory is not what it used to be well i don't think it is i can't remember yeah thanks mr Moo. Um, so you can see we get the full command line which is good and bad because if there were passwords in here we'd be able to get them but of course the security event log is only accessible to admins by default and we don't make our normal users local admins do we no we don't so there's a wealth of information in here about who the parent process was when it started and then we can find a, a corresponding end one so if i was diagnosing a slow log on which i actually do have a separate session for I could come back and do that some other time if uh, I get invited back. I'll rush to invite me back. Thanks very much. I'll just talk to myself. This is why I prefer in person events. Run vodka time. But I can just get those events from the event log. Yeah, so 4688, I can say get dash win events. Mine is log name security. You can see there's lots of it. What was that column name? Oh, let's do it. Just select first 10. It'll be easier. Rather than having to scroll all the way up. So ID, I could say you know, where, which is where object ID equals 4688. I'll go and get all the events back. And I could just select one as expand message and put that through something we can see. But you see, we've got a lot of stuff in there because each of these, as we saw before, was actually a, a, a large amount of information. You know, in here is not just the executable, it's the context, the token, etc. All useful, well, most of it useful information but difficult to get out. So what I did was effectively write a script around this. So if we can see what time I logged on, uh, 8.54 this morning. Um, I don't have young children, so I don't have to get up early for uh, it's half term school holiday here anyway. That's my excuse for being lazy anyway. So what I can do is use a script that's on GitHub, which I use pretty much daily for troubleshooting. So I can troubleshoot it for slow logons. I can do troubleshoot for application crashes. I, you know, if a CMD window, which we've all seen, probably pops up, you know, a black window at some point, you go, what was that? It's too late. Yeah, if you weren't and didn't have your crystal ball out to run prop on, you wouldn't know what was going on. But with process auditing, you do. So this is a great tool for, you know, audit, um, troubleshooting something that happened, you know, 10 minutes ago, 10 hours ago, 10 days ago, if your um, security event logs are big enough, you might need to make your security event logs, particularly on Citrix or terminal services or multi-session AVD, bigger to cope with the number of events. But you can go back in time without a time machine. So if I now do a run that script, which isn't on a share, so guys scripts, scripts, oh look at this. I, I haven't done this, but I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Heiko's uh, happy that I am running this, get process, durations. You can see I've run it. And so I thought this was an interesting one. Um, let's do that. Uh, 12 hours. That might take a while to come back. Uh, so I can switch to my other one. Honestly, my port scanners, oh, I control C'd it, didn't I? Anyway, so I'll leave that running. Oh, I hadn't had a, a Zoom meeting in the last 12 hours. Great. This actually tells me. I'll start it and I'll switch to the other window. Uh, let's make it 48 hours. So this is running that script again available on GitHub looking for this particular process. 
find that process. Wow, this is where this script itself again is, is useful just to gather information where which is a child process of Zoom. So th that happens to be um, the process I found that hosts your Zoom sessions. And this is if you're a guest as well, where you don't seem to get stats. I can then also so that it finds a 4688 event for all of those where CPT host is in that text. You know, I could do it within event viewer here. CT, no, I keep putting CP, CTP, CTP, yeah, CPT host, and that will eventually go and find it. But how did I know what to look for? Well, what I did was I knew that I knew my meter well, was actually, uh, I was actually late. It did actually start at four o'clock, but I was late. And my excuse was there's no pop up from uh, my Google Calendar. I'm sticking to that. So what I did was look for interesting processes. So if, if a user says, well, I, I had some issues with Zoom at about 10 past four yesterday. So either get in your time machine, get out your crystal ball or your tarot cards or use this script. So what we'll do is we'll say, well, the user said it started about four, 10 past four. So let's say start is 1600 on the Valentine's Day. Doesn't understand Valentine's Day minus duration of one hour. So what that will do is go and find all the events from the event log in that time period. Um, what, what, yeah, it won't find. It will have some warnings probably because I've not told it to look for terminations. It looks for start and terminations all within that one hour period. So you see, we get a few where it says, "Well, I've started it, but I can't find the end." event for it it's probably because it's sometime after that one hour in which case i'd specify all terminations which would search the whole event log from that start time to now but well uh, so what we've then gone and done is pull out the uh, interesting information from those events so this is all from those two four six eight eight four six eight nine events so if we go back to here uh, and we can see that the 4689, I think is this one. Yeah, so that CTP host.exe process exited, and that's a bad exit code. Is it, if it's good, it's zero, but I don't remember being a problem at the end of the meeting. Uh, and then that's the process ID, which obviously we can all convert in our heads, but of course you can paste that straight into PowerShell and it will convert it for you. Yeah. Oh, this really means much. I don't. I don't keep a note of the process IDs on my machine. I let the event log do that. So again, I can see that exited at what time was that? Sixteen fifty-five fifty. So just to prove this works. In fact, I can filter very quickly on CPT. And lo and behold, there we go. Sixteen fifty-five. And I even put the duration in. So that's how long that meeting lasted in seconds. But how did I know it was? CPT host. Well, again, the user said, or I, I knew that on my meeting started about 10 past four. So I looked in the uh, process created time, which is here, which it's sorted on by default. So I knew it happened round about here, and I knew I was looking for something to do with Zoom. So again, in the quick filter in the grid view, because remember the grid view is built into PowerShell, I can go Zoom. So it's zoom in on the anything which has got zoom in the name. So that matches zoom anywhere. We can get more specific criteria. So we could say the process contains zoom if we wanted to, but I just guess that it would have zoom in because it's installed in my profile in the zoom folder. That anything hosting a web session would be from uh, from that zoom folder. So I look down here at the duration column, which is in seconds. So I know I was on that meeting for best part of 45 minutes. I, I try to avoid meetings, but this one happened to be able to charge for, which is nice. Um, makes them worthwhile. And we can see that was 2714 seconds. So that was, yeah, and it finished then. So the, yeah, that would probably was the process. So I could then, and you know, it's got lots of interesting command line options and so on, but I'm not really interested in those. I could see the command line options. I can see who the parent process was. I could get the launch time of that parent process. I can see some of it was started from Edge. Uh, don't worry about the subject logon ID. If that says 999, it's not a user session process. 
well, it's elevated. And then because I also use this as a security tool, I can say, well, who's running stuff out of their profile? And I can go and find all processes. So I could, that's where I could say, well, what else is running out of the profile? So let's go bang and let's instead go um, process add contains Zephod, my username, although I've only got the one head. Some people say that's very big. Uh, oh, that's my username though, isn't it? So let's have a, no, in fact, let's filter it on zephod.guyrleach, which is the name of my domain. Notice it filters in real time, so it's rather slow. But what it should do is now only show processes which have got that path in here so I can see what's running out of teams <laughs> or is it teams running out of resources or well, what's running out of my profile is what I was trying to say if I rearrange the words things so it's mostly teams zoom and there is actually a because this script is, is done partly for troubleshooting and partly for security auditing there's also a summary option within the script so you can say oh we've got a good good old go to meeting in here as well and whatsapp update so I can use it as an auditing tool, and it also, which is why it brings in details of the of the executable, whether it's signed, who the exe vendor is. So again, this is showing PowerShell how we can bring in multiple commandlets. You know, get win event to get the events. We can then go and get information about the file. We can then go and get information about the signing of it. So we can bring that all together in one UI. And this is a script uh, I use pretty much daily for various troubleshooting. Something crashes or something unexpected pops up or just something that doesn't feel right, or I want to know what command line options something had. Because yeah, again, if I want to reproduce this manually, again, control C on that line or multiple lines, I can select multiple. In fact, the way this script works anyway is that this is using a minus pass through on the grid view. So all the op everything that's put in there then goes into the clipboard. So I don't even have to manually paste it. And the advantage of that is. Uh, it gives me structured data, which I could then further examine if I needed to. So that shows how we can use event logs to troubleshoot. So what I would look for in a slow log on, for instance, is you know, long running processes, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to dwell on this one. Um, but I would look at what processes start and stop during the, the user's log on time and then compare it with a normal log on. Oh, look, that particular process takes 45 seconds. And the user says the process is 45 seconds longer than usual. And it only takes 0.1 second on that machine where it works OK. Hmm, I think I found my problem. What is that process? Why is it running? Why is it running slow? Certificates I've already kind of mentioned. Registry, because we're a uh, PowerShell provider, I can uh, interrogate the registry. I can delete things. I can create them. I can change them all very easily. We can do stuff with uh, SQL, some sort of database, I believe. Um, I still do stuff in Sybase, to be honest. But there's a lot we can do in there. Either with the SQL uh, PowerShell command that you get with PowerShell Studio, or there are some built into .NET. Because whilst you know, having lots of uh, you know, people go, what's your favorite module? I probably don't have any because I don't use many third party modules, not because I want to write everything myself. No, that's stupid. If someone's got a module for something, why would you then go and write it yourself? No, use that module as long as you trust it. But because I write a lot of scripts to customers, they don't like prerequisites, as in you have to install this module and that module and this module before you're allowed to run the code. So I use REST for a lot of stuff. So a lot of Azure work, I'll use the REST API because I don't, all I need is you know, invoke web request, invoke REST method. I don't need any Azure. Uh, PowerShell modules installing. I don't need to keep them up to date. I don't need to worry about permissions and so on. Same as SQL, so I can do stuff built into .NET, so I don't need to have any uh, SQL command looks installed. And I can run SQL on, you know, on this Windows 11 uh, workstation that I'm using. Active Directory is similar to SQL in that there is the Active Directory module, which if you're doing a lot of Active Directory work, install that. Again, you can install it on your workstation. I think I've got it installed on here. Have a look at my show you all my yeah, okay. Um this is where I have to identity is very far. Is that gonna work? Yeah. But I could also do that through um got ADSI, the active directory scripting interface, which again is built in to .NET slash Windows, so I don't need that Active Directory module. A bit more cumbersome to use. Again, I've, there's some script examples on my GitHub repo. 
of using ADSI, but it does mean you don't have that prerequisite. But it, yeah, it can get quite painful to use. And then a whole lot more. Even if there isn't a built-in module for it, and again, there are a lot of modules just you know, available, both built in, and, and I've installed a few on my workstation over time, you know, from Microsoft, from VMware, from Citrix, other vendors you work with, and and again, pick them up from various places depending on what your PS module path is set to. Is this thing? Yeah, if I can type it. Yeah, but again, I can just split that if I need to. So we can see what it is. So, oh, I've even got some at these stuff on here. So somebody may already have made a PowerShell module. Yeah, look on GitHub and just search in your favorite search engine or yeah, some yeah, either scripts or modules to help with the yeah, specific area that you that you need. But when you take any script from any source, even from me, and you know, check it's legal, decent, honest, and truthful. It's not accidentally or deliberately malicious. How do you know if it's not? Well, you need to read the code. Even if you don't understand it, you can probably tell if it's going to try and copy stuff from users' home drives up to cloud storage or something like that. Or it might be accidentally malicious. You get it, you think it's going to remove one user, but it removes 15,000 of your AD users. And then it's kind of, ah, I wish I'd run this on, the, on a test machine in my lab. Hmm. Hindsight's wonderful, isn't it? It's the only exact science, in fact. Running out of time, um, but I've already done some WMI uh, Kim stuff. So uh, what I would suggest is you actually go and explore them. So that's how I find interesting uh, information is I go and say, you know, what classes are there? So you can actually interrogate and say, you know, get dash Kim class on the default namespace. And that will go and show you all of those. And I'll, most of the interesting ones these days are generally the ones that start Win32. So I can go and see in there and start searching. And because yeah, we want for disks, for volumes, users, networks, it's a shed load of stuff out there. And then not only just read only, some of these will have methods in and you can call them. So you can for services, for instance, you could get a service and then call methods on that service. So not just a read only interface, but then there's other uh, namespaces. What are the other namespaces guy? Well, I can't remember. Oh, oh, look, control space again. Yeah. So what is in the you know, Microsoft space? And then a whole different set of Classes in there, although not many. So you can then go and explore things. And on you know, third party systems, I, there are ones, some generally I've seen ones from VMware, Citrix ones I use in that analyze log on duration script I mentioned from Control Up. So there's a whole load there. And you can even just write a script that'll go and find every class and every namespace. And then you can search it looking for you know, the keywords that you're uh, interested in. You see some here have uh, methods. So that one has a uh, get security script and no doubt it will have a set as well. We could find that out. So it's a load of stuff. But yeah, use Kim rather than WMI unless you're having to code for PowerShell 2, which I really hope you're not because it's painful. It's a way I gather a lot of information. So I used to do a lot of on site health checks for you know, customers in the EUC space to get a lot of information all in one go rather than clicking around GUIs or you know, even MS Info 32 doesn't give you all the information you need. I had a script which you're going harvest every bit of information from every root level um, WMI class. So that gives you information about the machine, the memory, the disks, the network cards, uh, the software installed. It's pretty darn good for getting a lot of information very quickly. And there's a script actually on my GitHub repo that targets, I think, about 30 WMI classes for just very quickly going and getting a, information about a particular machine or machines. Because one of the advantages of this is that I can remote it. So if I do a get Kim instance minus control space, notice I've got computer name, but notice if you notice very carefully, square brackets, what does that mean? It means it's an array. So that can take multiple machines. So I can say GRL jump 01, GRL jump, guess what? There's a two, there's a three as well. I don't even know if it's online, but we'll find out. 
uh, give it a class name, Windows 32 operating system. Again, I'm too lazy to type it, so I'm just going to tab complete it. Then the first time it does this, it has to cache it, so it's a bit slow. But then you think, well, has it actually done it? Or no, it hadn't done it, you see. I hit space, so I was being um, too optimistic. Sometimes the IntelliSense kind of thing breaks down. So that will now actually go and hit it against three machines, potentially in parallel as well. Parallel, running stuff in parallel, sort of all over, uh, over the top of each other. Now, that suggests one of those boxes to me isn't up where I haven't got access. I'm running this as the main admin in this particular PowerSales chest. It's not who I'm logged on to my desktop as. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. OK, so that's telling me that um, Jumbo 3, well, it didn't tell me, but I can see that Jumbo 3 wasn't listed. So Jumbo 3, I forget what that was, um, isn't up or isn't, at least isn't available. You know, I can then do pings or test network connections and that sort of stuff. But I can go and get information from multiple machines. Again, and all this stuff coming back is objects. So I can then say, well, when when were they last blo bo booted? Booted even. Um, so, so we'll go computer, computer name. Again, last boo for a very small comedy effect. We'll get rid of Jumpo 3. Again, control delete to delete a word at a time. Yeah. See how much quicker it is when I don't. Um, let's get in fact, let's go and get our main controller as well. GLDCO3. That's online. It's good, isn't it? So when, yeah, how long have they been up for? So that's been up. Oh yeah, I run my lab 24/7. Uh, that's because I'm on fixed rate electricity at the moment. When that changes, I will probably look at powering it off, or rather, I shall automate some power off uh, overnight. Although quite often I am using it overnight because that's when my best development time is. So yeah, get convinced is useful for also remote troubleshooting as well. That's something else I've not gone on to. This is probably an all-day session, isn't it? Really, rather than an hour and a half. But although yeah, I'll use a profile. That's another good one. So rather than you having to mess around in HK Local Machine Software, Microsoft Windows NT current version profile list off the top of my head, and also in C users or wherever the profile folder is set to, which can be changed, you can access all that and delete profiles just using the uh, WMI class or Kim class. Filter uh, in the query because it's much faster. Remember when I was showing you before about the get win event? Uh, I was saying, yeah, that gets all events from the event log and then says pick out the ones with 4688. So with get with event log, it's slightly different, but I can tell it to only filter ID 4888. Uh, and in fact, I'll do filter. Again, this is in the script. So, uh, oh, I've hit one of those programmable function keys on my keyboard. No, you haven't, guy. You're just typing in gibberish and trying to get away with it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moo. Sorry, yeah, I just hit the G1 on this Corsair keyboard, which is some macro that I've never never worked out how to disable. Um, but yeah, filter left. So with get Kim instance, you can actually give it a filter. So let's show that one. Get Kim instance 132 process. Let's select first 10. And what I can do is then filter. Mine is filter, get some quotes in there, name equals it needs more quotes. Unfortunately, let's go for LSAS. Not very useful at the process, very secure. And that just go you know, rather than doing a, a where name equals LSAS through a pipe, which will get every process back and then filter it. Yeah, just so that's what which is this is what we mean by filter left, as far left as you possibly can. Sometimes you can't filter there. You know, if I was going to use a regular expression, the filter parameter doesn't support regular expressions. So I'd have to get stuff back and then filter it. So you can't always do it. And um, how long do you want me to talk for? I could talk for hours and hours and hours and <laughs> hours because we're only on the first of about 10. How many actually how many slides are we on? Let's have a look. Are you still awake? That's good. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, in fact, let's view slide sorter. I mean, I'll, I'll make all slides available anyway. Uh, let's just zoom that down a bit. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah. So I've managed to make it to slide six out of uh, probably 20. Yeah. 
So you probably don't have enough time for this. Maybe we need a part two. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Part two, <laughs> part two. Yeah. The return. Part I spy, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah there you it. go. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. I only know nine German. Oh, no German words. Oh. The ordering, <laughs> no, you ordering a beer in German? No, I don't drink beer, but so I, I can I can get past that one. Okay, uh, but yeah, I can still okay. remember Exi Beer Parakalo, which is six beers in Greek from 1990 when I was touring with guess what? Five other people. <laughs> Yeah, because these sessions, everyone is unique because it's, oh, what have I just thought of? What can I show? What's happened? So each one is, well, I wouldn't say tailored, but it's just, oh, yeah, you know, what 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 crops up? What can I do? And I'll say I'll make the slides available. There's a lot, and there's a lot of links in them either to scripts that I've written yeah. or other other resources. Um, well, well we, 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 we can ask the audience if there's anything particular that can be seen on your, you know, as a headline of your slides if somebody you know would, would like to see something in particular um so feel free to give us some feedback here um anybody still awake <laughs> i'm i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure and you you might be sure but you're not pretty <laughs> well it's also great that you're providing the materials here i find that no longer how long you've been working with powershell um there's always something that you haven't seen yet and a lot of times you just need to have that inspiration there you see something um say oh that's possible and that that triggers some curiosity and you dive into that and that's how you learn even more about powershell and, absolutely um, I, I, yeah. I learn every day still every day i learn something yeah, I also found uh, some, you know, some some nuggets here and there about things that I never came across. Like, oh, okay, I didn't know that this is possible. So that's really, that's really cool. So is there is there one thing that you still would like to talk about in this session, uh, guy? That like like. So if not, well, if we I can... go to if I go if I bring up this slide, which is my top ten. Okay. And uh, some that's... of them we've seen already, like guest process get command. Testnet connection, um, export CSV, again, great way of getting data out. I used to use that a lot more. I, I tend to use out grid view now. As you've seen, that can be incredibly useful for filtering information. Export Get Excel. Again, <laughs> we've seen these. This is one which I, use, I do use a lot as well. So if you've got a problem on a remote system, but you can't MS, you know, somebody says they can't log on to it and you go and MS TSC to it and you go, mm, yeah, I can't log on to it either. But how are you going to troubleshoot it? Well, you might be able to get it as event logs, but depending on what it is, you know, I can then go to, to if I go to my jump box, this is kind of like Telnet. Yeah. If you've ever used Telnet to Unix boxes. So I'm now on that machine. Yeah. So if I type a uh, YIP, we all know what GIP is. It's IP config or get IP. And I, is it? I can't remember what you that command is get dash alias definition. Yep. Yes, it does. You just used it. No, not definition. Stupid. Definition is what it is. So if I had said get net IP configuration, yeah. So you can see I'm actually on that machine because if I come out of here and type yep, you'll see it's different because and we're different network interface. So this is my who. Um, my jump box, which is a VM in my uh, in my private cloud, aka my garage, where I've got an old Dell rack mount server warming it nicely for me, and this is on my my local machine. Yeah. So once I get into the remote machine, control R to search, I can do pretty much anything. So I can do you know get that service, see what you know it has a particular service stocked. So I can do you know command line troubleshooting. The only thing I can't do, you know, if I try and run something like Notepad, it just hangs. There's no Notepad window popped up on either of my screens because that's a Windows program. Yeah. So I've had to control C it to, to stop it. So anything Windows wise won't come up. But you know, what if I need to check a registry key and I haven't got remote registry access enabled? Well, I could do an LS, which is a if you know Unix or Starnix, then that's you know, list file, but except we do it for registry keys. Software, software, Microsoft again. I'm tab completing registry keys. 
to go for Windows NT because we all know that's one of my favourite hereditary keys, which is an interview question I used to ask a long time ago, Windows NT, current version. And then we can see you know, what's in there in terms of values. I could change it. Yeah, for, for every PowerShell noun, there's an equal and opposite now a verb, sorry, which was Newton's fourth law, which was not very well known back in the 1600s. So I can actually do a set item property to change uh, an item if I need to. So enter PS session, I use a lot for remote troubleshooting, particularly if you've got, let's say you've got a single user system. Sorry, somebody, probably an Amazon delivery for me. Um, so the dog's all going a bit ballistic. But yeah, if you've got a single user system and you want to troubleshoot it, so a Windows 10 AVD or you know, Windows 10 laptop or something like that, and the user's using it, then you don't want to um, say, oh, can you just log off while I MSTSC to it? Because you've only got one single user session. While that user's still logged on, you can do your enter PS session and do stuff. Yeah. So logged on to here as an admin is me from the or my admin account anyway, 28th of January. So I could go and do things in their session. I can do remember I've talked about get process. So I could do a okay, what process is they running? Where session ID is equals to two. Yeah, I can see that. And is there anything using lots and lots of memory that might need killing? Um, sort, working set, minus descending. And let's have a look at the top 10. Yeah. Oh, look, there's a very large sort of CPU wise. There's a Perl process that's been using and using a lot of working set as well. I sorted that on working set, but it's used a heck of a lot of CPUs. So what's that all about? OK, well, I could then go and look at that process or I could kill it or Again, killing things fixes problems quickly, but doesn't help us understand where things have come from and why they've got into the state they, they have. So it depends on you know, how much time you have to, to fix a user problem compared with being able to investigate it. So you can probably you know, stop it happening again, potentially. You know, do I even need to run Perl on here? And why is it used so much CPU and memory? Yeah. So, yeah. So back to your question. Yeah. Enter PS session is out of all those top 10. That's probably my my favourite, but those are the one. These are ones I use pretty much every every day. All right, okay. I think this is this is a great summary for for so summarising the the session. It was I, I this was really great. So thanks a lot, guy. No problem. I hope it helped. People like to say I'll make the uh, PDF of this available via Twitter at some point today or tomorrow. Perfect. It's going to be recording as well. I hope. Yes, yes, and I, yeah, I pasted in the chat the link to your Twitter handle to your GitHub repo already. So, and um, I will, yeah, we, we will upload the, the, the video to YouTube and I will put the, the link then into the meetup description and in the info. So that will happen in the next couple of days. So I, th I think we are, uh, this was a very great session for the restart of our, for, of our user group. What do you think, Ryan? Right, this was awesome. Yeah, definitely. Good to see a good number of people show up here. Um, we definitely are not seeing a one-off here. We plan to have several more meetups. Um, we'll be both doing online, and we'll be seeing you in person eventually too. So, um, thanks for showing up. Yeah, th thanks a lot. And um, yeah, so we are, we are planning for the next session uh, in April, actually. Um, we are already, I think, nineteenth uh, uh, um, of April. Nineteenth of April. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say April the first. That's always a good day to have an event. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be, yeah. So we are, and you know, we are, of course, looking always looking for speakers. So if people are in the in the session and they have a topic they want to talk about, very welcome to contact us. And we might already have maybe a real. Uh, um, venue where we can have a, a hybrid session we are working we I, we got in touch with someone or someone got in touch with us who is has a has a, a company here nearby in our region so maybe we really gonna have a hybrid one the next time we'll see we'll keep you posted so i would say again thanks a lot for being with us thanks a lot guy this was really awesome and very mm -hmm. very very helpful so again thanks a lot and have a good night yeah, thanks, thanks for your everyone. time, Guy. I know it's not always easy just talking to the monitor, so appreciate <laughs> you taking the time for us. And no problem. Ho 
hope to meet you in person sometime soon. Likewise. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again. Bye bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you. Bye bye. Tschüss. Tschüss zusammen. Tschüss. Guten Abend. Ciao.